You gotta be doing well though. Start, test, test. Um, look, we're really lucky to have uh, Brandon Watson, MD, PhD, a townie, come back to us. And uh, he's now on our faculty as assistant professor in psychiatry and a mover and a shaker in the neuroscience grad program. Uh, you know, I feel like I know him very well. I don't know him hardly at all, other than, you know, his father is one of my best old friends. And I hear about you all the time when I spend countless uh, hours, including two days ago with your mom, uh, you know, who tells me about her kids constantly. So, you know, I feel like I know you very well. And we're lucky to have you. Um, Brandon uh, studied, uh, he, he went, to, went to school in New York. Uh, he started in, in Cornell University, but then uh, moved to the New York City, where he got his PhD and MD, uh, at, you know, at uh, Columbia University, and then went to uh, Weill Cornell Medical Center for a psych res residency, literally right down the street, and then uh, did some uh, uh, assistant professorship getting ready over at the uh, NYU at the Neuroscience Center and did a postdoc there. So incredibly good background, computational neuroscience, interest in depression, interested in circuits, and uh, really is, uh, you know, it's delightful to have you as a colleague and, uh, you know, and uh, we're really excited to have you here at VCMB. And uh, he'll be leaving here to make a mad dash to the psych ER at about 10 minutes to the hour, but his uh, colleague will be uh, picking up the baton and will keep us going, and there'll be a nice discussion at the end. So, uh, Brendan, and, uh, and what is your name? Can you? Yeah. Uh, welcome. Yeah, uh, it's great. Uh, we're glad to have you, and we're looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you very much. That's a very nice introduction. and. Yeah, so I'm a psychiatrist, but I'm going to talk about some pretty basic neuroscience stuff, and then there'll be one slide at the end saying that we're going to try to do neuroscience. <laughs> I mean, try to do psychiatry, I mean, uh, with some of these neuroscience techniques. Um, so, and, and this being uh, bioinformatics, I figured I'd try to talk. You know, I, I actually thought a lot about what to talk about, and actually my PhD was pretty computational in orientation in the sense that we were trying to think about how the brain computes. Um, but I actually thought I would... Make, make it almost more like a, a pretty basic talk about neuroscience, neuroscience methods, and some of the more interesting, I think, uh, 
directions that neuroscience is going, and then I'll bring in some of my own work as well. So hopefully it's just sort of a generally useful talk for people to get into the field. So, um, so here, uh, I just wanted to just, I'll explain this slide actually in much more detail later on, right? But I just wanted to give you a little sense of what some of our, some of our uh, data looks like sometimes. So just the fact that how, you know, and I, I don't know what to assume about how much neuroscience people know in this room. So I'm going to be pretty, start at the bottom a little bit, but hopefully it still works out. So all I'm showing you here is that as an animal runs along, uh, Space. So an animal, there's a rat, and it's running, and we're recording neurons from its brain. And what we see is that uh, there's a neuron that fires early on when he's in one place on this track that he's running along, and then different neurons fire at different points as he moves along the track. And so neuroscientists, we think that the timing of when action potentials come out of neurons, and I'm assuming that everyone knows what those are, but um, we think that when they happen matters a lot, right? And so what I'm going to talk a lot about is when they happen, how they happen, and how they switch around uh, in brain, in different brain states, like wake and sleep, for instance. So here we're saying that we think that there's a cell that's signifying that the animal's in one place, and that somehow that this cell always fires in this place, and this cell we know from lots of other recordings always fires in this particular spot along this track that the animal's running along. Um, and we think that the fact that those cells are firing at those times gives information to the, to the individual, to the rat in this case. And the other concept that I wanted to broadly introduce before I get into the details of them and how they combine is these oscillations. So if you do an EEG, just put electrodes on the outside of the head of a person or a rat, or if you put an electrode inside the head, um, we get these oscillations, right? Um, so there's just your recording voltage between, let's say, your electrode on the top of the head and somewhere else, the wall. Um, and you'll see that there's these voltage oscillations that happen. Uh, and what we're trying to show here is that across different species, we have oscillations that are shared. Uh, so there's alpha oscillations, and they have a certain frequency. There's spindle oscillations, and they happen that there's about 10 fluctuations per second in there. And there's these ripples, ripple oscillations, and they have happen at about 100, 100 cycles per second. Uh, frequency, but there's these shared oscillations, and we don't know what they're for, right? So people People are starting to put together what they're for, but initially we didn't know what they're for. And it seems that these actually may, since I said that timing is important in what the action potentials are doing, these actually time and coordinate action potentials between neurons. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about more about how we know that, how we get the data out, um, and what we see when we get the data out. So first things first is how do we do our recording? So we use these devices called, uh, well, I use silicon probes, but Essentially, they're bundles of wires. And here at University of Michigan, there's these things called Michigan probes that um, NeuroNexus is a company in town, but it all started at U of M Engineering School, and now they sell worldwide. They make these things called Michigan probes that are essentially silicon printed uh, pro, uh, wires. Uh, and then, so here's an example. So this is all these yellow things are cells, and we've done a surgery and put this eight shank uh, probe into the brain, and at the tip of each shank, we have recording sites, and you can kind of see the recording sites here, 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 right? These kind of little squiggles along the edge of the tip of the probe, and each of those is a place where a signal can be recorded. So in a typical probe, we'll have 64 recording sites, eight sites on each of eight shanks, and here's the kind of data we get out. So we get out these streams of voltage, and we record it 20,000 times per second, uh, 20,000 points per second, and so here this is you know, this time scale is 10 milliseconds. So we can get, we can record huge amounts of data um, over large numbers of channels and try to figure out what the heck is going on from this data, right? So there's a couple of major things that people tend to classify. So one is these kind of slower undulations, right? You can see this kind of bump here, right? Um, so this would be actually corresponding with those EEG oscillations we saw. And that's a, they're kind of a little bit bigger and slower in time than these little fast blips, right? These fast blips are smaller and they're not homogenous. These, these, os these, these slower oscillations are kind of homogenous across all these channels. These blips are non-homogenous and the blips are action potentials coming from individual neurons. And so there's uh, bas some basic signal processing that we do to separate action potentials from the field potentials that are going on around them. So the field potentials are where the oscillations happen and the action potentials we think are controlled by the oscillations. Oh, I, want, I was supposed to show you this. So this is just a, a more um, 
I turn this off? I think it works. Okay. So uh, this is an example of just a zoom in of here's some recording sites and all these little square circle things. And these are uh, neurons that are stained. Just as a bit of a zoom in. Um, and so we get this data. Here's, a, here's actually another picture of just some raw data. We might have an animal with this whole apparatus hooked up to its head, and we've implanted this kind of uh, Faraday cage surrounding an electrode. The animal can basically freely run around and has this counterweighted stuff on its head. And we can stream data on our computer, right? And so this, in this case, we have 128 channels that we're recording, and we're showing seven of them. And we can see the action potentials and the field potentials fluctuating. So how do we get spiking data? And again, since this is well, I'm trying to be a little bit more data processing oriented than I would usually be. So what we do is we get, let's say we have one of these shanks, these, these uh, series of recording sites on the tip of one of our shanks, right? And so fundamentally what we see is that we have different, we think that there are different cells firing at different points in time. And at the end of the process, what we find, what we're trying to get out, is seeing, we see that there, are, when let's say cell 31 fires, we see these little action potential events down at the tip of the, our recording array, whereas when cell 21 fires, we, still, we see events uh, here higher up on the array. And every single uh, cell is next to a different set of electrodes physically. And so then its action potentials register on different spatial parts of the electrode array. And so the question is, how do we get that out? And so there's a couple of approaches um, analytically to get those spikes out. So most of them start with some kind of filtering. We, we High path filter, uh, get rid of those slow field oscillations, first of all, to try to get our action potential. Because again, we think that action potentials are literally the key to consciousness and perception. That is the best theory that we have as neuroscientists. Uh, when you're firing action potentials and you're seeing a red dot and your, your red dot cells are the ones that fire, that's how you think and know that there's red. right? So we think that action potentials are super important and we really want to get those signals out as best we can. Um, so I just, you know, I don't know how detailed you guys would want to go, but there's a couple of rough approaches. And this is a more traditional approach where we'll, we'll do some filtering, we'll threshold and detect events uh, that go below, let's say, a certain line, these little dips, right, go below a threshold. We can extract some features, maybe using principal component analysis to represent these waveforms, and then try to cluster them and say, each cluster represents one of the cells that we saw in the previous uh, previous slide, right? So um, we're actually representing as across channels, across all of our recording channels, our vertically arrayed channels on that previous slide. Where do we see the most amplitude? And some cells will have a lot of amplitude on this channel, and some cells will have a lot of amplitude on this channel. And we can obviously have more than two dimensions. We might have 48 dimensions, right? One channel for it, one dimension, let's say, for each channel. We can look for clusters in that multi-dimensional multi space. And a more modern method is actually um, uses, instead of this thresholding and, and, and dimensionality reduction and then clustering, actually uses, and I'm not going to be an expert on this, I'm sorry, but uses template matching. So it, it actually is first generate, you have to tell it, I think there might be about 256 neurons in this data set. It generates 256 random uh, action potential-like waveforms, and then it iteratively fits those waveforms, real waveforms, to these generated templates. So it uses this convergent iterative uh, methodology to kind of take forward these randomly generated putative templates and match them more and more closely to real data. Um, and then actually then goes back and finds where the matches to the templates occurred in the real data. So we, in the end, can get out um, dozens or even hundreds of, of spikes from our recordings, and we can um, go from data like this to data more like this, where we sort of neuroscientists can kind of go to town. Uh, what we call, I would call this systems neuroscience, where we're interested in spiking and action potentials and how they coordinate. Systems neuroscientists, what they want is lots of neuron firing times. Let's say each row is a neuron, each little tick is a spike, and you just get to go to town and say, okay, when did each neuron spike, and are there patterns, and does it correspond to behavior? Things like that. So we can go from this voltage data to spike trains. Um, so now we go back to this figure again, right? So this is how we got these spike trains out of this data. 
Um, but the other thing to notice is that actually what's plotted up here is the local field potential, those EEG type potentials that are slower in time scale. And actually, one thing that's I think you can see is that there's a pretty regular oscillation happening right in here, and then it degrades and becomes less regular, right? And it just so happens that this regular oscillation is happening right at the times when all these cells are firing. And that's not random. Um, so uh, basically, the kind of oscillations that happen correspond with the behavioral state that the animal is in. So for instance, in this case, when an animal is exploring, like when all those cells were firing in the previous slide, there's this theta oscillation. Theta just, in this case, means about 8 hertz oscillation. The animal is looking around, exploring, engaged, attentive, possibly moving. And then when the animal kind of stops and just rests, this theta oscillation stops. It stops being this more regular oscillation. You get these kind of irregular blips, right? These are called sharp wave ripples. So brain state and oscillations of, are, are very closely tied. I'm actually going to rotate this just a bit. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why the oscillations might be doing what they're doing, why they're coming in and out and being modulated by state and by task, and how they impact those spikes that we think are so important to basic perception and, and brain function. And so here's an example. So um, this is that same, same trace, same voltage trace from a rat's brain. Uh, where we have theta and then sharp wave ripples later when the animal relaxes. Here's a blow up of some theta oscillations. You can see it's not perfectly rhythmic, right? But it's, there's, if you did a Fourier transform, you get about an 8 hertz oscillation. It's pretty regular here. We have this superimposed other oscillation, which, by the way, is probably actually pretty important. It's called a gamma oscillation. So if we take one of these kind of idealized, uh, an idealized cycle of this oscillation, you can break it into phases. Oh, it got a little offset, sorry. But you can break it into 0 to 2 pi or 0 to 360 degrees. You can look at the phase of the oscillation. What we can find is that the neurons tend to only fire. So again, if we have phase here, neurons tend to fire during certain phases of this oscillation, and they don't fire at other phases as much. So, right, so it tends to fire more around phase of 360 and less around 180. So these oscillations are actually seeming to impose an order upon the, fi the firing patterns of the neurons. Um, so if, again, we take one of these, well, what happens if you know, this is just one neuron and, when it, and how it fires relative to the phase of this theta cycle? Well, actually, if we take multiple um, neurons and make them all fire in phase, they'll actually all fire at basically at the same time. right? So this is a pretty easy mechanism to synchronize neurons. And so actually, just to kind of emphasize, we, we think that it's not just whether or not action potentials are fired that matters, but we think that it's actually whether they fire synchronously that matters. There's this big problem in neuroscience called the binding problem. So you have an apple and it's red. And we know that the cortex represents the shape of an apple and the redness of an apple in two different parts of the cortex. Right? These are not the same cells. So how do you get conscious of the fact that the apple is red? And it's the same percept that has both of these two features that have been segregated into two feature detectors in the brain that are physically separated anatomically. We think that even if two, two feature detectors are separated anatomically, as long as the action potentials are synchronously firing, you will bind those two, the shape and the color, together into being conscious that that is one percept. So we would perceive it as one unified object. Or you see someone moving their mouth and you hear a sound, you think that that person is talking because there's synchrony of firing. So maybe these oscillations are doing that. Maybe these oscillations are making neurons fire synchronously. I'm going to skip this a little bit because it's a little too complicated. But I will get to the point of it, which is, which is that there's actually an interesting phenomenon which has two different names. One is phase procession and one is, is theta sequences. But, um, so that was just almost like a historical slide. But what we actually see is that, so while on average, let's say, you know, these are our theta cycles, right? On average, neurons tend to fire during these troughs in the cycle, down here, down here. But actually, if an animal is running, so what we're recording here in this case is from neurons in hippocampus that are tuned to particular places, just like that very first figure I showed you, where as the animal moves, different neurons tend to fire over time. 
So on a long time scale, this animal may take five seconds to traverse as it runs across a track, across a plate, across a table, let's say. But what these cycles actually do is they, so this is eight hertz, and so there's about 125 milliseconds per cycle. And so while on average an animal might take five seconds to run across these regions that where, where cell one fires, and then cell two fires, and then cell three, cell four, cell five, six, seven, eight, it might take five seconds to do that. What we actually see is that for some reason, um, in every one of these 125 millisecond cycles, we actually see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Over and over and over again. So these cycles seem to actually come, kind of go up and sample the larger tendencies of firing and compress them in time. And we don't understand the mechanism of this. What they do is that, you know, over five seconds, you'd usually get this sequence of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But what a theta cycle seems to be able to do in the hippocampus of the brain is actually make that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight happen in 125 milliseconds. And that's interesting because this is the kind of time scale that neurons can interact over, right? Neurons work really fast. They have millisecond time scales. They have these membranes, and if you give it an impulse of information, um, it'll keep that information for a little while, but then it'll fade away, right? So you need to have fast interactions for neurons to be able to be integrating information. And so not only are neurons synchronously firing, and maybe one reason that the synchrony matters, they're not just synchronously firing, but they're getting, they're firing at a, at a synchronously at the right time scale. So these aren't too slow. They're fast enough to let neurons that are, let's say, listening downstream of this circuit that we're recording from actually integrate the information. Actually, yeah, and then I'm going to skip this too. Um, sharp wave ripples seem to do the same thing as theta cycles. I'm just going to very briefly introduce this idea that, remember, we had these kind of two modes. So this, there was an animal sort of looking around exploring on the left of a slide and then kind of doing nothing. And its brain switched from these theta cycles to these sharp wave ripples. Interestingly, these sharp wave ripple events that kind of look like this, they actually also seem to replay. So, so while the theta oscillation uh, takes information and kind of makes it into these 125 millisecond packets, um, as the animal is actually actively experiencing it. What sharp wave ripples do is they actually replay those same bits of information that were packetized before. They replay it when the animal is offline. So this may be how the brain resculpts itself for learning and memory, for instance. You see a lot of these sharp wave ripples um, during sleep. And we know that sleep is really important for learning and, and for consolidating memory. And so maybe it's the replay of those 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8s that we see during ripples that allows memory consolidation to happen and for, for the brain to sort the important from the unimportant information, things like that. Yeah, I don't think I need to go into this. Ripples matter. So um, so I just wanted to give you kind of an, I mean, I didn't do all that work, right? That's from the field that I come from. But I thought it'd be interesting um, to get a sense of what, how the field thinks about oscillations. And I want to give you a sense of how important we think spiking is. And I want to tell you more now about what I did during my postdoc. Um, which is a really different way of looking at oscillations and a really different way of looking at how spikes are working. And it's not so focused on kind of online perception, but more kind of how do we, how do these oscillations in different oscillatory states seem to regulate um, maybe homeostatic uh, purposes, uh, necessities in the brain. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain more. So kind of just at a 20,000 foot view, you know, so I was, I was, new to the lab, Yuri Buzaki's lab at NYU, and I started doing recordings, and I started seeing these massive changes that, you know, this is a figure from somewhere else, but you start seeing these massive changes in the oscillation states of the brain, and I started, I got curious to understand what, why are there these huge changes? This kind of just jumps off the page. Like, if you just put a rat in its own home cage, and it has an electrode in its brain, and you're turned on the recording, you see these big shifts, right? And so it's just interesting to know what, what these shifts are doing and what they're for. It doesn't take much imagination to, to decide to investigate them. And it turns out what they relate to is, is sleep stages, right? So when the animal's awake, you have these uh, very small oscillations, and they, they're frequent, right? So they're frequent, so they're high-frequency oscillations. Whereas when the animal's very deeply asleep, you have these larger amplitude and slower evolving oscillations. Each cycle is physically longer. The wavelength is longer, so the frequency is higher. And so one way, by the way, that we analyze this, and which I'll show you, is we use a spectrogram. Where what we're doing is we're taking Fourier transforms 
um, of these voltage traces. We do that, we we'll basically take a batch of one second of voltage at a time, and we'll do a Fourier transform on each one second piece of data. And whereas Fourier transforms will usually have, you know, an x-axis showing, an x-axis showing frequency and a y-axis showing power, and have some frequency uh, power relationship. What we actually do is show that here, but each of these x, y axes are now turned sideways. And instead of y being amplitude, color is now amplitude. So what I'm trying, all I'm trying to say is that this is time here. Every one of these strips is one second. And when we have red, it means we have a lot of power at a particular oscillation frequency. Right, right. No phase in this case. We can use, we can look at phase if you do wavelets. Yeah. So, but. So this, this is a multi-taper version of a spectrogram, and here's a wavelet version of a spectrogram. But we, you know, again, kind of what jumps off this graph at you is these big red blocks, right? That's not, again, <laughs> very imaginative. Um, but what this is is when the animal goes to sleep. So whenever the animal goes to sleep, there's a lot of power in this kind of 1 to 32 hertz range. And what we also found, and this is what, what was known already, so, sorry this label isn't very clear, but when an animal transitions from one brain state to a next, to the next, not only do, so this is now a, a wavelet spectrogram of time versus frequency power. Uh, so an animal goes from non-REM to REM. We both see a decrease in the power in these low frequency bands. We also see that um, the cells fire differently. So if we look at the raw voltage trace here, we see these, just like these delta waves, these big wide, large amplitude waves, uh, we see them here in this rat recording, right? It tells us it's in non-REM sleep. And we see that with every one of these waves, if you look at our population of neurons in our, in our uh, collection of action potentials, we see that neurons tend to stop firing, like right here, and then start firing, right? And then they might fire at other points in time, stop, start, stop, start, and that happens with every one of these oscillations. So again, we have oscillations, controlling, spiking, in the, and this is in the cortex, not in the hippocampus. And so what I started looking at is how oscillations and firing rates are sort of co-modulated in the cortex. So right, so this is kind of back, back to my usual slides that I use in, like in my job talk, right? So I'll turn on the tape record, the, the tape machine and start talking the way I usually talk. But so, but I'll try to a little fast about it. <clears throat> so, so what this comes back to is what we wanted to know about is how these switches between brain states like sleep and wake affect the 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 circuits that are actually in the brain. Like, what does sleep actually do? And one major hypothesis and theory about sleep is that sleep helps us work properly, helps us stay healthy and do good stuff, right? So here's some poor lady's to-do list from the internet, you know, and so when somehow we can handle all this stuff every day, go to sleep and wake up and do a whole other to-do list, right? And there's all sorts of clinical evidence that without proper sleep, we have all sorts of problems, right? We can have mood disruption, you can get kind of giddy or angry, or you can even have manic episode if you have bipolar disorder if you don't sleep enough. Um, epilepsy patients can have seizures, learning and memory and performance decrease without sleep. So sleep is necessary to keep us attuned, but we don't understand how sleep is doing that. And so what we wanted to look at is one of the major theories and see what we could add to it. So there's a theory uh, from someone at the University of Wisconsin, Giulio Tononi. Um, and he basically hypothesized that over the course of wake, what happens in the brain is that uh, activity increases, and then with sleep, activity decreases. And actually, what he's plotting here is synaptic strength, not, not uh, strength of activity, per se. Synapses are obviously the connections between neurons, and so stronger synapses might make neurons fire more. Um, so he has this hypothesis that with wake, we increase in upscale uh, connectivity. And with sleep, we downscale connectivity. Um, and he has some data. Maybe, yeah. He has some data showing that, you know, as sleep progresses, he shows here that firing rates of neurons decrease and connectivity seems to go up uh, when you're awake. And with sleep, it goes back down, just like his theory says. We wanted to look at that. Um, so where we looked was in frontal cortex, um, which we think is important psychiatrically and for decision making. Um, and we looked at a certain, we looked at about 80% of the neurons that we recorded. They're the excitatory neurons in the cortex. We think carry most of the important signals. We wanted to see if we see a decrease in firing rates over sleep, just like Tononi, just like this hypothesis would have present, uh, said. And well, technically we did. We 
did get these statistically significant drops from before sleep to after sleep or from the first third of sleep to the last third of sleep. We got these drops in firing rates in neurons overall, became less active. But I mean, this variant is huge, right? And it made me feel terrible about myself as a postdoc. Like, what? How come my figure doesn't look like the other one? Um, so I ended up doing a whole thing about the error bar. <laughs> um, and time is a little short, so I'm going to go a little bit quickly. But what we ended up finding is that um, neurons have highly, so first of all, we already knew that neurons had highly variable firing rates. And so this is a log scale here. So some neurons may fire at 10 hertz, and some neurons may fire at 0.01 hertz. Just their tonic basic firing rates are super different. And there's a lot of work that I think needs to be done to figure out why. But we use the fact that neurons have these different firing rates. And then in fact, those firing rates are correlated across different brain states in any given one cell. So each dot here is a, is a cell. And so we say, but, you know, this looks like a kind of like a label that we can use for every cell. There's some high firing rate cells and there's some low firing rate cells. Um, and we use that as a label and we tracked our cells based on these labels. We divided our firing rate distribution, because if you plot it on a log scale, it's pretty, pretty normal, pretty Gaussian. Um, it actually might be a gamma distribution, but we, we basically made these bins of uh, you know, the highest firing group of cells, the lowest firing group of cells, and a number of groups in between. We made six bins. Um, and what we found is that actually, so what we did here is we have uh, about an hour long, no, about a 45 minute recording of, of a rat, and rats go to sleep and wake up really quickly. It's not like us where it's eight hours. Uh, so, so what we have here is we've scored different brain states based on those field potential fluctuations. And we see that, you know, so when the animal's awake, it's black, scored in black here. Uh, all these times in black, the animal's awake. And we see that the highest firing rate neurons tend to fire the most when the animal's awake. And then they downscale when the animal goes to sleep, just like that synaptic hypothesis uh, predicted. But interestingly, the lowest firing rate neurons, they actually upscale and fire more when the animal goes to sleep, which is actually different from what people had thought. And so we actually see this homogenization rather than a downscaling with sleep. So the idea is maybe rather than sleep just kind of dropping everyone's firing rates. And if we just measure total spikes, we do get a total drop in firing rates because that's what happens to these dominant high firing cells that have the most spikes per second. They kind of dominate the overall effect if you just add up all the spikes because there's very few spikes in these cells. But actually there's a homogenization that happens over the course of sleep. So this is the beginning of sleep, this is the end of sleep. So from the beginning of sleep to the end, high firing rate cells drop their activity levels and low firing rate cells increase their activity levels. And so we see a narrowing of this distribution. Um, so suggesting that what might sleep really be, might really be doing is uh, homogenizing neurons. Rather than downscaling neurons, what sleep might be doing to neural circuits is homogenizing the elements of the circuits. And we, we had some other ways of verifying the findings without we, we did a regression rather than uh, making groups, and we find this, that there's a significant finding there too, and that and that this effect lasts from before sleep to after sleep. Um, so we wanted to kind of quickly go and look at at the different parts of sleep. So like I showed you in the other slide, there's wake and then different stages of REM and non-REM. Um, so we broke, we did some automatic clustering on our spectrogram and broke our sleep into different states, and we found that. Non-REM is where most of this narrowing happens. Most of this homogenization of the neurons happens during non-REM. To kind of skip ahead, um, right, so we have this narrowing of a distribution. So what these guys' theory would have predicted is that, and this is a very dominant in the field, so they predicted that sleep downscales, right? And so if you have a firing rate distribution, as shown here in black, by the end of sleep it should just be shifted to the left, it downscales. What we actually find is that rather than everybody shifting to the left, we have some the least active elements increasing and the most active elements decreasing, right? So we have homogenization rather than a downscaling. And as I said, most of the downscaling seems to happen during non-REM sleep. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about more about that and about the oscillations that happen during non-REM sleep and how they might relate to the downscaling. Again, oscillations might matter, but in a very different way. So rather than kind of forming and shaping activity, we're going to focus here on maybe the fact that they do some other things. It, they serve some other purposes for the, for the spiking. So first of all, so I already showed you, right, there's these big waves. And then with every wave, there's kind of this stop and start of firing by populations of neurons. This is 
cumulative firing rate of a population of neurons. It goes up and down with these waves. So, and this is called the synchronized state, actually, right? So this is a state where overall the population tends to stop and start together, right? And if we do a recording from inside of a cell, we see these stops and start and stop and starts and stops and starts with every one of these waves. Um, interestingly, so it turns out that with every one of these restarts after a stop, means I do have to go soon. Every one of these restarts of firing after a stop during non-REM sleep, um, certain cells tend to fire early in the, re in the restart, and certain cells tend to fire late in the restart, and that's pretty reliable. So there's a certain timing to the spikes that happen when the, when the network gets reactivated. So, and, and so that we were showing that here. So, so every one of these dots, again, is a neuron, and it's ever its timing of spiking after a restart. So in the first half of sleep, a certain cell will tend to fire with a low latency, and in the second half of sleep, it'll tend to do the same thing. And there'll be some cells that tend to fire with high latency, both in the first and second half of sleep. We also did this with even and odd numbers in our sequence of stops and restarts. Doesn't matter. But some cells tend to fire early, some cells tend to fire late. And what we found is actually that the cells that tend to fire the earliest are the highest firing rate cells. And if the, by the way, so these are mean firing times, not first spikes, uh, so for those of you looking for kind of null hypotheses. But so the mean firing of, of high firing rate cells is different from the low firing rate cells. And it turns out that if you kind of apply one of this, this thing, and I don't really have too much time to explain, but it's called a synaptic timing dependent plasticity, spike timing dependent plasticity. It's a learning rule that allows synapses in the brain to strengthen or weaken depending on when they fire relative to each other. So if one neuron fires right before another, the synapse from that first one to that second one gets stronger. The, the, the brain has this kind of use it or lose it rule, where if some piece of circuitry gets used over and over, it'll reinforce and strengthen that circuitry. But if it doesn't get used, it'll weaken. So by that same set of rules, basically, if the early cells tend to be high firing rate neurons and the late cells tend to be low firing rate neurons, on average, Synapses from high firing rate neurons onto low firing rate neurons will grow stronger based on this rule. Whereas synapses from low firing rate neurons, which I'm showing as littler, onto high firing rate neurons, those will grow weaker. Which turns out to be exactly what you would need to do to homogenize a firing rate distribution. You'd be giving less drive onto high firing rate neurons and more drive onto low firing rate neurons. And if you leave an, a brain like circuit, in silico, if you make a model, and you leave it to kind of just not have this synchronized up-down state in these stops and restarts with these structured firings, what will actually happen is the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer, and the high firing rate neurons will just run away and become, will fire more and more and more because we'll gather up all the synapses and the low firing rate synapses will get, firing rate cells will lose all their synapses and get less and less. You'll get this spreading of a distribution just like what happens during wake. And one way of counteracting that, at least in a model, is to have these stops and restarts that happen about once every second with a structured firing where high firing rate neurons fire first and low firing rate neurons fire later, and that'll actually homogenize your distribution. So maybe what these oscillations are doing is rather than organizing data, they're actually allowing homeostasis to happen by having these stops and restarts with a particular firing pattern that follows them. So yeah, and then the other thing I just I wanted to mention, so I am a psychiatrist, I had all this training in neuroscience, and a chunk of the lab is going to be doing some much more psychiatrically oriented work. We'll be looking at stress and antidepressants and how they work. We'll be combining some drug studies, some electrophysiology, some behavioral studies, and we'll try to do look at these things across different time scales. Um, so yeah, I wanted to thank both those who helped me where I came from and the people who are now in my lab, like Cheng Yu, so, and in the interest of giving him enough time, I thought I would turn the mic over to him. And he has a bunch of slides about his work that he's been doing and reanalyzing some data since he's come to my lab about what we've been calling the synchronized state, where all the neurons turn on and off at the same time, <coughs> where he's finding maybe some weird asynchrony. You want to come? Yeah. Yeah, I have a couple minutes. I have like a few minutes before maybe Tang Yu comes. Yeah. 
I am. There's, yeah. 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 Need to think about. <coughs> that would be great. I mean, in, in this, I mean, so first of all, all of what I told you is obviously we, we make our own MATLAB code or Python code. And that's certainly, there's plenty to do there. And then this, I think, this project will fall, it's much more like what, say, Srijan Sen is doing, if you know his work, I know you do, where he's really trying to look at predictors and correlates of stress in humans with their cell phones, and do they type slower, do they move around less. We're going to try to do some of the same stuff with rodents, and then try to correlate that with things that are happening in the brain. <coughs> so we're going to have, for instance, lots of different time scales that we're going to be having to analyze at, weeks to milliseconds, right? We're going to have a huge amount of data, I think, once we finish, or once we even start collecting this data. It's going to be a large demand for, it's going to be multi-dimensional data with both multiple time scales and multiple ki kinds of uh, kinds of measures. Uh, and I could definitely use, I'm sure I could use some help on that once we actually get the data. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. That's an interesting point. So the oscillations are not entirely generated by the cells. To some extent they are, but actually they're probably not mostly. Um, there seem to be sort of cell independent mechanisms. So that's not entirely true. Cells are important, but <coughs> firing rate independent. So for instance, so during one of these periods here, which I didn't even introduce this slide, but you know, basically all the cells stop for this column of time, and then they all kind of start again, and then they stop again. And we can see that there's a corresponding wave in the voltage trace when the stop happens. Um, basically, when activation has been going on long enough, and you're in non-REM sleep, and the neuromodulatory, like you don't have as much serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine floating around in your cortex, that seems to turn on a channel that actually might, there might be uh, essentially channels that close down after a certain amount of time that cause this mass shutdown. So there actually seems to be mechanisms that are not entirely just based on the actual action potentials themselves. For instance, in the hippocampus, the theta oscillation is based on these oscillatory cells somewhere far away it called, in a place called the medial septum that is sending this oscillatory drive up to a bunch of inhibitory neurons. I'm getting pretty deep. Sending up to inhibitory neurons in the hippocampus, which then have these sort of oscillatory uh, network structures that they can sort of turn on and they can oscillate with a few of the cells and make this dominant rhythm for the majority of the cells. So they impose this external field upon the neurons that, the neurons, that most of the neurons don't generate. And if you actually measure intracellularly, you can actually see these fluctuations do impact. You know, because neurons have thresholds, right? So if you get above threshold, you're likely to fire. The, the downswings actually inside the cells very tightly correspond with the swings outside the cell. Yeah. 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 yeah that's just starting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we should. For sure. Well, sleep and so I think what we'll try to do is measure for like five or six weeks, and we'll have a baseline period with no stress. Then we'll have half of our animals get stressed, and then half of our animals will get treatment. So half our animals, so two weeks of no, nothing, two weeks of stress, and then treatment after the fourth week and with a two week of some kind of recovery. So maybe either ketamine treatment or like a chronic Prozac type treatment, something like that. And we want to first, you know, I think the field is really fractured or kind of missing information in terms of the rodent stress field. They rely on these tests like the four swim test where you take an animal like a rat or a mouse and put it into a warm tank of water and see how long it tries to swim. You videotape it, right? And that, that's fine, and that's done a lot, and it's actually led to some pretty good screening tools, but <clears throat> it's not really very close to what human stress, 
that's not what a patient will describe as their depression, right? That's like one, one little thing, right? So I, I think in there, there's a handful of these. So I don't mean to say there's only one test. There's a handful of sort of similar tests. But you know, I, I think a better way to do it is to actually do chronic measurement of what the animals are doing in their home cage under basal conditions. How much are they eating? How much are they sleeping? What are they eating? We'll give them some choices of water, different kinds of there's like sucrose preference, for instance, and fatty foods versus regular foods. Stress seems to influence people and animals to eat fattier things, weight changes, cardiac, cardiac variability. So we'll try to measure lots and lots of things just to actually, I think, for the first time, describe what is the stress response in the rodent first. And once we do that, we'll try to do some neurophysiology afterwards with some implants and try to see what corresponds with what in which part of the brain. The other dream is to record everywhere in the brain, but that's another, that's hard. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> Consolidation of sleep, like as a metric. Like to what extent is it spread out over the day versus it's nicely packed into one. And, and thought about it in terms of what? In terms of stress or in terms of other things? The mechanism, I am not an expert on that. So like hypothalamic and pontine sleep regulators. So like the traditional story is there's all these kind of deep brain structures that regulate street sleep. But of course, like anxiety is one of the greatest ways of fracturing sleep. Uh, so you know probably amygdala and prefrontal and hippocampal circuits can influence those. Um, and so yeah, I haven't thought about that and I haven't thought but Someone should, actually. It would be interesting to think about how that happens, where that happens. Can you change that, fix that? And can sleep, sleep is known, as I was showing in one of the slides, to perturb mood, right? So if you could actually make sleep be more consolidated, add depth to it, for instance, maybe that's a treatment. That could be really interesting. Yeah. 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 Better run over there. They're going to get down my throat. OK. So 10 years. Sorry, I have to leave. That's bad. Just Hello? Okay. So um, I'm a postdoc, uh, currently working in uh, Brendan's lab. And uh, so what I'm interested in uh, is the uh, con communications between uh, cells, uh, especially in cortex, uh, during different brain states, like wake, different states of sleep. So, um, so the way I uh, kind of try to quantify the, uh, uh, the, the communications of the, uh, between cells is using the cross correlate. So um, put simply, uh, so let's say we have uh, a, a reference cells and we have a target cells. So they fire, uh, so for, uh, for, cell, for the reference cell, let's say it's, it fires at a certain time. And after a short lag, uh, the, the target cells also fire. So uh, what, cor what cross program does is try to find uh, what is the probability of the target cells firing after a certain, uh, at a certain lag of the, uh, of the after the first, uh, for, uh, after the reference cells firing. So in this case, uh, like this, Cell fire at, a, at around two or three uh, uh, time unit, and this fire like one or two unit later. Then the probability of the uh, target cells firing uh, will be the biggest uh, at this two time unit, right? So that's the basic concept of cross choreogram. So. So what can we do with uh, this cross choreograph? 
So for this, for cross program, we can either look at a short time scale. That means uh, a very short time lags. Uh, like um, in this example, uh, it will be within five minutes second. So like in here, this is the lags. So it can either be positive or negative. So uh, if we just look at this tiny time beams between five, negative five millisecond and five millisecond, um, we can use the information in there to find either excitatory connections or inhibitory connections. So for this example, this would be a typical uh, case where it should be an excitatory connection. Uh, so when the reference cell fire at zero time, uh, the target cells in here, if fire, there's a larger probability of firing uh, at around five milliseconds or four milliseconds in this case. So, so then we know that, okay, so there, here, there is an excitatory con connection and uh, it's from the reference cell to the target cell. Let's say if we have a peak in here, in the other, uh, in, in the negative legs, then there will be uh, excitatory connections from the target cell to reference cell. So the, the same rule can also, also apply to inhibitor connections. So if we have a, a, like a trough uh, within this short, short, short legs, then there will be, we can say that it's an inhibitor connection. But uh, since we are only using the spike information uh, to, to try to find these connections, it is not necessarily uh, going to be a true synaptic, there, there might not be a true synaptic connection between them. If we want to do that, we need to do some uh, calcium imaging or something to, to find if there is really synapse uh, that, that connected between cells. But, uh, so, so basically what this can find is the function that we call a functional connection. So there might not be a real connection between them. Okay. So with that uh, principle in mind, we can develop an algorithm to try to detect uh, whether there's uh, excitatory connections or inhibitor con connections. Like, uh, like in this case, uh, uh, we can try to uh, rule out the insignificant uh, or, or false positive results, or, um, and we can find either excitatory connections or, or, or inhibitory connections. So, um, so, so basically, we just throw in a bunch of spiking data uh, between uh, for all those cells, and then we can just generate this uh, this. Uh, kind of complicated uh, sub neural networks, and uh, um, the the red dots here are shown as inhibitor neurons, and the blue dots there are shown as uh, excitatory neurons. So uh, the way to classify inhibitor neurons or uh, excitatory neurons is using the uh, is using the waveform shape of the spikes. So it's not it's so, so this cross program doesn't do anything, uh, does ha have nothing to do with uh, uh, classifying whether it's interneurons, uh, or whether it's inhibitor neurons or excitatory neurons. But what it does is it can, uh, it can try to detect uh, what is the connections between them, whether it's excitatory or inhibitory. So in here, we can see that uh, here we have this cells and that, that cells. They, Based on the waveform, they look like they, they, they should be like uh, excited or neuron, but in fact, um, they are uh, inhibit they are inhibiting uh, all the other cells. So, um, so this tells us that probably um, there's still a lot to explore about uh, uh, how to classify uh, uh, neuron cells properly. Okay, so so this is uh, uh, like a, a matrix of about cell cell pairs uh, cross program, and um, in this case, um, like for 
for example, this one will be the cross chromatogram from cell one to cell two, and this one will be the cross chromatogram from cell two to cell one. So it's cut in half so that um, these are not symmetric. So this is like the positive lag, and this is like the negative lag, but reverse, uh, but, but uh, in the reverse order. Yeah. So what we what we're interested in in this case is uh, so this here now the time scale is the long time long time scale. So previously uh, the short time scale can predict connections, uh, the function of connections. But for uh, and we, we wanted to look at uh, this long time scale and see if there is any interesting behavior going on. And um, one. Example is that uh, maybe we can find some similarities uh, of the pattern um, uh, about how they, how they, uh, what's their impact to other cells. Like for example, this cell, its uh, cross chromatogram pattern is similar to this cell, right? So. We want we kind of want to kind of try to capture uh, whether we can maybe cluster uh, those cells that act similar to other cells and maybe they or they they act as uh, similar roles in a sub network. So um, so because uh, we have this matrix, we can sort of uh, define the similarity uh, or distance matrix and then. We have, if we have that pairwise uh, distance, we can uh, we can convert it into global distance, and then we can construct a low dimensional manifolds uh, to see if uh, two two cells are close to each other. So, and this is what we did. And uh, uh, like in previous example, it's sort of uh, 23 and 52 are pretty similar, and in here they are pretty similar. They're very close in this uh, low dimensional manifold. It's like a, a dimensional reduction thing. So, um, so, so now that we have this, and uh, we wanted to compare with uh, uh, with the functional connections. Like, in, so we wanted to look at the the uh, whether there is a relation between the uh, the uh, functional connections derived from the short time scale and the um, this similarities uh, derived from the long time scale. And this is still uh, ongoing work. So now uh, I want to switch gear to a different um, different uh, research uh, project that I'm working on right now. Um, so now uh, this is as a, a cross chromatogram, and but now uh, it is a, a full full cross chromatogram, not just cut in half. So so this and that would be symmetric. So I just ignore all the lower tri triangular part. And from from here we can see that um, some of them. So this is also long time scale. So we wanted to look at the cross chromatogram and long time scale and want to see. Um, uh, if there is anything interesting going on, and what we can see here is that some of them have uh, this uh, positive correlation, but some of them have this negative correlation, like anti-correlation thing going on. And when we look at this cross chromatogram across different brain states, uh, like this is wake state and this is slow wave sleep state. Um, like the, uh, the slow sleep state is the uh, state Brendan just talked about. Uh, it has this delta wave that uh, has up and down states going on. And um, so in this slow sleep state, we can see that uh, there are more peaks and more troughs going on uh, in relation to wake. Right? And in the REM state, it seems that the trough and we uh, trough and peaks are also weaker. Uh, so, so slow wave sleep has the most prominent uh, this peaks and troughs features going on. 
So we sort of wanted to um, look, dig, dig, dig a little deeper into this, and we just uh, stack all the cross choreograms. So these are all the cell pairs. We just stack them, and we just sort them uh, uh, by the central uh, cross choreogram um, amplitude. So slow A sleep has this nice peaks and going to trough. But wake and REM, uh, after sorting, it's just not that, uh, not as clear as slow wave sleep. So we try to um, um, quantify, uh, quantify this trough and peak. Uh, and one way to do this is to uh, fit uh, this cross program pattern with Gaussian. And, uh, so, so that we will get the information about the height of the peak or, or depth of the trough, and also the width of this this Gaussian, uh, this like the width of the Gauss, uh, the, the width of the height or the trough. So, and this is what we get. Um, we sort of find that um, so this is the 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 Gaussian weight, uh, the histogram of the Gaussian weight. And this is during wake, this is during slow wave sleep, and this is during REM. So it seems that uh, the slow wave sleep has this wider uh, distribution, while wake and REM has, has this squeeze effect. And if we plot it uh, uh, like this, um, so again, this is the Gaussian weight, uh, Gaussian height. Um, slow wave sleep is most is widely distributed, while the, slow, uh, the wake transition to so it's sleep or uh, it, uh, it get widened but if you go to RAM it gets narrower again and you can also see it from so basically this what this does is uh, can can be seen from here so basically uh, if this is getting getting bigger uh, it, so so in the so this is zero Gaussian height so if it's about that, um, it when a transition from wake to slow wave sleep, uh, the height is getting bigger. So it's uh, and yeah, and then it's getting smaller and it's getting uh, deeper and getting shallower. Yeah. So um, another thing we want to look at is uh, whether this. Uh, anti-correlation spin has a certain phase preference, and uh, so what we did, what we did is uh, we take the wavelet, uh, we, we we take the LFP, the local field potential, and we do the wavelet transform, and then we can get a phase of the, yeah, uh, to get a phase of the LFP, uh, the local field potential, and we look at uh, how wh what is when when certain cells are firing, what is their is there a preference uh, phase um, for all the uh, for all the power that we get from the wavelet trans transform? So what we find is so, so in this example we have three cells and these three cells they are they oh, they anti-correlate with each other and this is their phase preference and so for the star these stars are insignificant. They have insignificant phase preference, but in solid line they have uh, significant phase preference, and uh, so so there are some phase preference difference, and we wanted to see uh, at which frequency, uh, which fre at which frequency band would it affect uh, this anti collision the most, and what we find here is that around one point. Uh, in this case, it's about 1.27 hertz, so it's right at the lower delta uh, delta band. Um, we have this most anti uh, correlation. Uh, the most uh, the coefficient the correlation coefficient is the lowest, like the phase difference and versus the Gaussian height. Uh, if you have more phase difference, the Gaussian height is is more de negative, so we have this uh, nice uh, anti-correlation thing, 
um, at this 1.27 hertz. But um, the, for the width of the trough, uh, the, the correlation coefficient doesn't really capture, uh, it, it doesn't have this nice uh, big minimization uh, point right there. So probably the, the, um, the depth will affect uh, this, uh, the, the phase difference will affect the depth of the trough more than the width. Yeah, yeah so this is still an ongoing work. And uh, I'm happy to hear about any suggestions. Uh, and that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. So, so I think um, why why the uh, excitatory or inhibitory is uh, kind of like an important topic in neuroscience is because uh, we kind of wanted to know. Um, like what is the balance between excitatory cells and inhibitory cells, and what's their role in this uh, neural network? So um, this this uh, functional connection things can sort of capture that, and I think that's that's why it is used for. So yeah. the inhibitory cells it has certain cell types. Except for yourselves, they have different cell types. And so, yeah. um, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you.